Ah, yes, here we go. Everyone's, it's ticking over towards the time. Has everyone been enjoying and using the new Naptan? Mm -hmm. No, no major, uh, there was no major screams. Nobody cried. Nobody told me this was the worst thing ever. So therefore I'm thinking we're going quite well. I, I still can't download it into my systems, but. Trisha, is that, yep. is yeah. that, you're on Omni something, yeah. aren't you? Well, well, yeah, we're on the Trapeze Nova system. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't oh. like it if authorities upload 2.4. If authorities do 2.1, it's fine. Um, yeah. It, but um, it doesn't like the 2.4 version. I think we've got some, we know about that and we're working with the different vendors to ensure that they're, that they do the updates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, it'd be nice if everyone kind of moved, moved to something that wasn't old enough to drink a pint. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not, if you're not aware, um, Naptan, the 2.1 version is now old enough that I could take it for a drink. Well, we could all take it for a drink down the pub. Um, 2.4 is not that is not that young, but at least it's not that old. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've been getting around it at the moment by um, some of the authorities use the same Nova system that I do. So um, if I need to import them into a real time, the real time side, I create a 2.1 version. OK, I know, I know I shouldn't be doing that, but yeah, it's um, and as long as you've got a workaround for a little bit, that's mm -hmm. not such a bad a bad problem. If you if you said to me this was stopping us dead in the water and we don't have a workaround, I'd be a little bit more. Yeah. No, I always try and find a way first. <laughs> There's always, this is one of the, and this is part of what we're going to be tackling today, just to let people know. There's 140 something local authorities across the country who put data into NAPTAM. There are 140 something ways of doing everything because everyone over the years has worked, discovered workarounds that work for them, that work for their systems, that work for their technologies. And some of this is just kind of smoothing out some of those edges so that people who produce the data for Naptan and consume the data for Naptan are kind of on the same page as to where those things need to sit. Um, what's the time? We'll give it another couple of minutes just to let people join. We've got 37 people in the room. Quite popular today. Um, also, with the mural, um, we're going to do a lot more voting uh, because there's going to be so many people. There's going to be a lot more voting rather than asking people to come and do individual um, pieces of work on it or anything like that. So let me, let me, we've got another couple of minutes. I think we're beating we're beating my previous record for number of people that came to one of these. So, um, Holly. Yes. Hate to, hate to ask you. I pinged you on Google Chat, but I'm not sure if you saw it. Um, oh. If I could get you to share your screen, because I'm using the web version, and if I share, everyone loses my face, which just turns me into an, an anonymous voice, and you can't see the excitement that I gather, <laughs> that I get when I start talking about these things. So if you can share your screen, we'll start off. We'll start off with. Oh, we've still got people joining. I'm just going to sort out my desktop i'll just okay take a moment and it will come up hang on for those who don't know holly holly is another um business analyst from thoughtworks who is helping out on this on this dft project and is coming along today to provide technical assistance for me because with so many people you we we each need multiple hands Right. Just while I load it up, I do quite enjoy that cat. I hate to point it out specifically, but the cat behind Mike uh, Fosker, it's a very nice cat. <laughs> <laughs> 
Perfect. And, and if, on my screen. And if you follow, and then if you if you do a um, if you follow me, I can then control the screen. Aha. We have this we have this one and truly set down. So very quickly, what we're going to do is I'm going to choose 20 people at random from this list. There'll be people I know and people I don't. And you're going to give me your name, your pronouns. So do you use he, she or they or something else when somebody's referring to you? Where are you from? Which company or local authority? And then I've asked a question, bus or train or tram or Hyperloop, which would you prefer? So just to start you all off, I'm Dr. J. Uh, I use they as a pronoun. Um, I'm from ThoughtWorks and I'm working with DFT as a service designer business analyst on the NAPTAN redevelopment project. And for me, um, I really like, I like buses. I also like trains. I like being able to sit there and meet people and just watch the world go past. So who am I going to choose next? I'm going to choose somebody from the A's. Andy, Andy Hole, you've got to be one of the first people I call on because you've been here, done that. Uh, morning or uh, afternoon, Dr. J. Yeah. Hi, I'm Andy Hole. I am a, a he or a him. Uh, I'm from National Public Transport Information. Uh, I'm the Data Development Manager. Um, and I would, from that list, I would Hyperloop, whatever a Hyperloop is. A Hyperloop is the Elon Musk driver Tesla through a Rotherhise tunnel style facility as public transport. They okay, kind of I'll gave they, they kind of gave away my thoughts on it rather, didn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I thought Hyperloop was a pneumatic tube one, like what they do with uh, in the supermarkets. Oh, uh, that would be the, cash out, the vacuum tubes. Craig, that would be so much better. And I'm going to pick on you next to do your intro because you've already sure. given us the so, answer so to the question. Right. So, so uh, my name is Craig Standen. Uh, you can use he and him. Uh, I'm from Vix Technology. Um, we, uh, we supply ticket machines and real-time information services. Um, and actually, my background is in bus, and I know where I am with a bus, so I prefer buses. Fantastic. Um, I'm going to choose Darcy, Darcy Harmer Manning. Oh, that's a nice surprise. <laughs> I hardly ever win anything, so that's quite good. <laughs> so my name is Darcy Harmer Manning from Passenger Technology Group, um, Product Manager. Uh, in the city's team, so we look at um, from from this uh, sort of perspective, um, our data quality and third-party data data set uh, management. Um, so I would, um, I mean, uh, there isn't a hyperloop um, near me, um, unfortunately, but I think it'll be a lot quicker to get to where I need to get to. But I choose bus. Fantastic. And which pronoun should we use for you, Darcy? Uh, you, uh, uh, yeah, he, he, he. I was going to say he, she, or they <laughs> is usually the quick one. Um, <laughs> let me let me go back up and I'll go for Chris Burkett from Oxfordshire. Hi, sorry, couldn't find the right button. Um, I'm Chris, works for Oxfordshire County Council, um, uh, sort of a, a data manipulator in, within the council. Um, I would choose the Hyperloop. I would thoroughly enjoy the bus, train or the tram being able to look outside, but I'm figuring the travelling in the Hyperloop might not be wonderful, but you could get further, faster and see the world. Fantastic. And <laughs> what pronoun do we use for you, Chris? Uh, he or him. Fantastic. Uh, Alexandra Levin. Levin. Hi, my name's Alex Ben. Um, I work at Basemap. Um, I use she, her, and I probably say I, I don't, I'm a really bad person. I don't really use much public transport, despite the company I work for. <laughs> probably shouldn't be saying that. Um, but I'd probably go for train. Fantastic. Uh, I am going to choose Di Wright as the next person on my on my list. <laughs> Hi, I'm Di Wright from Connectees Valley. I'm a she. Uh, train for me I think because that you know exactly where it's going to stop <laughs> fantastic and I'm going to go for Gerard Butler thought you might um Gerard Butler transport for London uh hey um well it's got to be bus I think because that's the most inclusive mode of transport it's consistently accessible where some train stations or railway stations aren't Hyperloop, um, 
honestly thought it was a breakfast cereal, but obviously it's not. <laughs> no, no. I do like it. I do like the idea of it as a breakfast cereal. Um, Tess Harwood, you're the next one. Hello. Hi, I'm Tess. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I am... Oh, if I I am the innovation lead on the bus open data service, so working to get people using bus data, and so very interested in everything Naptan as well. Um, if I had to choose one, I'd have to choose bus because it's what I think about almost every day. Um, but I do also like a bicycle. Ooh, I love the way you chose something that wasn't on the list. I, I approve <laughs> of that. Um, Joe Lynch, you're the next the next one up. Hi, I'm Joe. Uh, I, um, I use he, him. I work for Smart Application Management, uh, support operators in the use of uh, smart ticket machines. Uh, and what I would not use is anything devised by Elon Musk, probably a bus <laughs> instead. Thank you, John. Oh, thank you, Joe. Um, let's go for John Wicks. Hi, yeah, I'm John, uh, known, I suppose, as a he. Uh, work for Stagecoach, I'm the business support manager. So, being as it's Stagecoach, is pretty much all bus. Fantastic. Um, let's go for Melanie. Uh, uh, Melanie uh, Dolan. Hi, I'm Melanie Dolan. I'm she. I'm from Kent County Council. And I would have to pick bus. Fantastic. Uh, Mike Fosker. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Mike Fosker. You can call me he or him. I'm a product manager for our transit data systems at Eto World, and I'm going to pick bus because it's the only one that's within an hour's walk of where I am, but I would be quite like to try out a Hyperloop. I'm, I think <laughs> the nearest one of those is probably the other side of the world, though. I'm I'm wondering where you are, whether it is the moon, it being an hour's walk from a bus, but I'm assuming it's somewhere quite rural. <laughs> I know it's the only one within an hour's walk. So ah. if I had to walk to a train station, that would take me over an hour. Okay, right. I've got you. I was a, I got confused there. Um, let's go for Rebecca Chan. Hi. Hi. Um, so we're doing icebreakers. So. Thanks. We're asking people's names, pronouns, where are you from, and whether you prefer a bus, a train, a tram, or a hyperloop. Rebecca seems to be doing some invisibility cloaking there. So I'm going to pop down to Ryan from Passenger Technologies, and then we'll come back to Rebecca. Hi, yeah, um, my name is Ryan Howell, he, him, um, working for Passenger Technology Group, same as um, Darcy, um, and I'd have to choose bus. I think I'm legally obligated. <laughs> uh, let's go for Sindhu Vincent. And Holly, how many more people do I need to do? Five more people. Right. Hello, everyone. My name is Sindhu, and uh, I'll be a she. Uh, I'm from Durham County Council, and um, I like using the bus and the train, actually. I do think the train can be a bit more scenic, depending on where you go. Yeah. I like it. I I have a thing for just watching the world go past mm, and not having yeah. to think about driving or anything like that. It's yeah. so... Just relaxes. Um, Teresa Evans. Oh, hi. Um... Yeah, Theresa Evans, um, she, I work for Dorset Transport, Dorset Council, um, public transport and infrastructure. So um, I deal with, uh, you know, new bus shelters, repairing and the RTI screens. Um, I would have to say bus as well. I would be surprised. I'm surprised at the number of people on this call who haven't said buses, given our obsessions. Uh, Tricia Wright. Hi, I'm Tricia Wright from Nottinghamshire County Council. Pronouns are she, her. Um, and I, I mean, I like travelling on all modes of public transport, um, but I actually use the tram to work, so I'll pick tram just to be different. 
Thank you. Um, and I'm just trying to remember somebody who I haven't had. I'm just walking back up the list. Hans Patrick. Hans Patrick Milligan. Three, two, one. OK, uh, let's go on to Leslie Dransfield. Hello, um, hello all. I'm a she, her. I'm from Torbay Council, Transport Officer, and I would choose the bus. Fantastic. And I'm going to do the last person, and the last person I'm going to do is going to be Adrian Falconer because he needs to introduce himself. Uh, thanks, Jay. Uh, hi, my name is Adrian Falconer. I'm the product owner for the redevelopment of Naptan at DFT. Um, and so if you have any issues with the switchover of Naptan, etc., etc., don't raise them here. Um, shout my ear off after the meeting and I'll do my, what I can to, to resolve anything. Um, thank you very Fantas much. Fantastic. Oh, sorry. Pronouns he, him, and I love the bus because living in London, there are lots of them. Brilliant. So very quickly, what we're going to do today, we've just done the intros and welcomes. Then we're going to talk about why the changes, why why things have changed. We're going to do a quick explainer on Eastings and Northings. Very, very quick. And I know there's people here who know it much better than I do. So we'll, it, this is a quick flyby 101, ensuring that we've all got a base knowledge of what they are. Then we're going to talk about how precise we need to be and how accurate we need to be and just get an understanding of everyone's view on accuracy from both the producers and the consumer side. Um, how do we get to latitude longitude as data consumers? Just kind of talking about that and talking about some next steps that we might take and then we'll have some feedback, a little spot for feedback at the end. Now, because there's lots of people, this is going to be just a little less interactive than some of the previous ones that I've run and we'll do some voting and use the voting system a little bit more on, uh, on Mural. So first off, very quick, why the changes? <laughs> so new NAP10, works in a slightly different way to old NAPTAN. So old NAPTAN took the data, put it into a database, and then did some manipulations with it and put it out. But it only worked for NAPTAN 2.1 schema, and for some things it didn't work very well. So what we have then done this big redevelopment work. One of the things that we do is we take the data as it's given to us by the local authority, and that is the data that's published. We don't make any changes or fill in blanks. If there's anything left out, we respect that. And there, there is one exception, which is the notes field, which we remove because it contains some personally identifiable information for some individuals. So there's some stuff in the notes field that we didn't want published. So we've stopped publishing the notes field only. That's the only thing that we don't push out. Um, we also don't convert inf information. If you give us the information as a particular value, we don't go, oh, no, 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 we know better and we're going to change it to this. We just leave it at the value that you've given to us. This is because we respect the source and we do any changes at source. So one of the things a lot of the data producers have done in the last couple of months is we've been starting to build out and, and build the download from the private beta onwards, we've been contacting particular local authorities and said, oh, by the way, your data has this problem. Can we look at how we could correct it? And we've done that with quite a few people and quite a lot of different things. So how does this impact us? Well, all local authorities are giving us Eastings and Northings. Not all local authorities are giving latitude and longitude. So NAPTAN is no longer populating the latitude longitude field. Now, also, there was reasons why we didn't do this, because at times the old NAPTAN was overwriting the information or giving a level of precision that didn't match what was given in, in the Eastings, Northings. There was going to a, uh, a lot of, of decimal places which weren't needed. So we've been in a public beta with new NAPTAN since I think it was the 5th of November or the 1st of November we moved across. It was, it was at the start of 1st of November. It was the start of November we moved across and opened up NAPTAN so that everyone could consume it. You can download all of the files from there. And we're turning off download from current NAPTAN next week. At the end of this week, start of next week, current NAPTAN, being able to download the files from the current system will be gone. And this means that we can start 
to work on doing things like publishing the 9x stops again and the upload journeys. Now, one of the reasons we had to stop publishing the 9x stops was old Naptan was so fragile that when we tried to publish the 9x stops, they were appearing in the wrong places. So we had um, 930 stops, which were ferries, appearing as trains and occasionally vice versa. We'd run the same script and they would end up in the right place and we couldn't determine what the difference was. So we were like, it's way too fragile to touch. Let's leave it in, a, in the stablest position we can. And as soon as we can, we'll move everything across onto the new system. So that's why we've had such a push to get everybody downloading from the new system. Hopefully that all makes sense. And that also makes sense of why we're needing to talk about precisely accurately where a bus stop is. So coming across Eastings and Northings and Holly might need to click off this so that it goes white and I can read it, but that's fine. Um, so this is looking at Eastings and Northings comes from the national grids. Uh, done by the Ordnance Survey Maps. And these are, everything's divided into squares and then divided into smaller squares and smaller squares and smaller squares. So we're looking now at um, one metre squares when we're, when we're doing things. So we're currently looking at anything with two digits. Uh, if you do an easting northern to two digits, you're giving a very large square of about 10 kilometres. That's probably not enough for a bus stop. There's going to be quite a few that would have the same. When you're getting down to six digits, you've got that one metre square. And that's where a lot of you, a lot of people seem to be giving us the coordinates for. Does that make a little bit of sense of what an Eastings Northings is? It's kind of mapping out a grid across the UK as it's kind of bent on the sphere of the globe. We've put we've plopped the grid on top and using that grid, you can identify where things are. Is there anyone who the Eastings Northings beyond who 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 needs more of an explanation of Eastings Northings and anyone who can help give a better explanation? Craig, I see you've got your hand up. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. So um it's probably just a, a, a misunderstanding or lack of understanding on my part, but if you've got um, six digits, Eastings and Northings is accurate to one metre. Um, how does that map to um, anything large? Let me do the math in my head, sorry, bear with me. Um, that would give you a, a grid of what, 100 kilometres by 100 kilometres or 1,000 by 1,000? Uh, no, it's mapping to a metre square. So if you give your six digits, that's mm -hmm. saying I've identified on the Eastings and the Northings doing like a grid map, that square is a metre square that I can identify. And if I change the next digit, it moves me one over or one up. And um, that's what I mean. Um, by following that through, so I can run the math in my head, that would give you potentially one billion metres. That's, that's a thousand kilometres. Is that big enough for the UK, a, a, a grid of a thousand kilometres um, by a thousand kilometres? Uh, I believe it is because I'm running from Ordnance Survey and they have set this grid up. But if anyone wants to help me out with the maths, I didn't expect maths, um, please, please let me know. Joe, I see you've got your hand up and hopefully you can help solve this. Oh, well, actually, I was going to go down a different rabbit hole. So Sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah. That's OK. Um, Thank you. Being, having been a good boy scout, I understand Eastings, Northings. Can I ask why you're not mapping onto Lat Long then? Why is Lat Long being um, done away with? Uh, we're not doing away with it, it, and this is part of this discussion. Most local local authorities are consistently giving us eastings and northings. They're not consistently giving us latitude, longitude. So what we wanted to discuss is, one, how accurate we need to be and how precise we need to be with our eastings, northings. And secondly, um, what is the impact of people not giving us latitude, longitude? If it's a respect at source thing, do we need to go out to local authorities and say, you have to also give us latitude, longitude? Or uh, is it something that the consumers can turn around and go, we can, we understand how to convert from Eastings and Northings to Lat Long, and this is the way that we're going to do it. So I'm just trying to have that open conversation. I don't no, want sure. EFT to kind of just go do it this way because that's not the way that we work. So um, would, you aim, would you aim to put that conversion in place or are you saying the client is going to have to, to do that job? We would we would not 
change anything. So this is one of the things of the respect the source, change its source. So if we want, if we have to have latitude, longitude, we're going to have to go back to all of the LAs and get them to put them in or ask all of the consumers to use a particular conversion. So and I'm sure that's, and that's the discussion that I want to have. OK, I mean, I, there are ATM suppliers on the call. There's certainly fix. Um, having used Ticketer, I'm aware that the bus stops in there use the Naptam let long and I can't see Northings Eastings. So will that have an impact on a system like Ticketer? Speaking as uh, as someone who looks at, you know, who, who looks after ticket machines at fix, it will have an impact on us. Um, but we're coming to be open mind to see uh, see what it means for us. But yes, this will have an impact for us. This is why we wanted to have this discussion to really understand the impacts that it's having for people and to make sure that that was understood by everybody. And we came up with a solution and worked towards something together rather than us saying it has to be this or, or it has to be that because we were hiding some of the we were hiding some of the data. We we're also putting inaccuracies into the systems. So occasionally and there was I found a good couple of hundred or more stops where this happened where the input had a latitude longitude in, but for some reason we were overwriting that with an incorrect latitude longitude with, from, from old NAPTAN. And that's the sort of thing that we want to stop. We want to make sure that if you give us the right data, we're going to publish that data. Um, I am just trying to see who went next and this will slide light. So I've answered Joe. So Neil McKinnon, you were the next person who had your hand up. I, I was just going to say that um, I, I currently work for Stagecoach, well, currently for the last almost decade and a half. But prior to that, I was at local government. And um, so local government has a long tradition of using ordnance survey data <coughs> and geographic information systems. So we've kind of grown up with Eastings and Northings. Um, so the Eastings and Northings start at the Scilly Isles in the southwest and extend right up beyond Shetland in the northeast. So the grid covers the whole of uh, UK. Um, Northern Ireland's got its own grid. The lat long thing is kind of interesting in that lots of users in the UK, born and bred, ordnance survey, lat long is something new and different, brought on by the use of Google and Google Maps and global systems. Now, the interesting thing about lat long is that there's numerous flavours of lat long depending on what geoid you use. So, how you approximate, how Bobbly because the Earth is not a perfect sphere. So how you model the surface of the Earth. And Google uses something called WGS84, which is, is now become the sort of de facto stuff, what everybody thinks of as lat long, but it's just one of many different flavors. Um, and so there's, there's usually a two-step process for converting from British National Grid coordinates to lat long WGS84 coordinates. Um, if you get it wrong, then you know, it's, it's an accuracy issue as well as precision. And there's a difference between accuracy and precision. So we need to be mindful of that as well. So it's, it's yeah, it's just getting a standard process in place. And I can see, you know, the history of the UK, that that'll be why Eastings and Northings are used. And it's just a case of making sure that the conversion process is right. And everybody knows what flavour of that long you're ending up with. Neil, you are the person that I was hoping was going to come on onto this call because you've answered so much of the questions and given so much background. That's absolutely brilliant. When, I'm going one of the to early put examples, you down as our expert expert witness. One of the early examples was um, when I was at university in Aberdeen with the oil industry, Shell were trying to replace an oil rig in, in one place and they did the conversion wrong and it cost billions of pounds to get it right because they sank their well in the wrong place. <laughs> Oops, that's a little bit like uh, not knowing the difference between metres per second and uh, feet per second and trying to put something on Mars and not yeah. having people use the right conversions. So it is it is very similar. Um, thank you for that, Neil. And I will, I've will i noted your name down. We will possibly use you in this as, as an expert for some of this because you do really have a lot of that knowledge that we need. I'm going to go to Andy Hole and go through the rest of people with their hands up before we move on to the next section. So, um, Andy. In National P yeah, hi. In National PTI, we represent about 32, I think, of the local authorities um, around the UK. And we are 
working with our developers at Mentz to, to include uh, LAT LON based on WGS84 uh, in our NAPTAN export as well as Eastings and Northings because we use it in our internal systems anyway. So we've already got the data, but we're, going, we're getting quotes to do that. Um, we may stall it until we know what else comes out of the DFT movement so we know what we're changing until we get one big bang update rather than lots of little ones. But lots of our downstream users, as on this call, like Ticketer, um, use our data and have exports from yeah. us. So uh, need the lat long as well as the Eastern Northern. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And thank you for um, also being aware that sometimes these things aren't just as easy as putting it in because everyone's got their data as Eastings Northings. Uh, Chris, Chris Sherry. Hello, um, I just wanted to um, <coughs> sorry, add on top of what Neil said. That, um, so we use lat longs, we use the WGS84 um, lat longs uh, in our system. Um, and from my understanding, the uh, Ordnance Survey uh, GB36, that was created in 1930. And from what I understand, has been deprecated since 2014 by Ordnance Survey. Uh, so it's quite old. Um, one thing I was wondering, so we've been um, putting in a conversion ready for the new NAPTAN. So we convert from one to the other. And as Neil said, it's a two-step process that involves um, datums and curvature of the earth and things like that. Um, I was just wondering whether uh, some of the providers like Bix and Ticketer who are on this call, whether they ha had to do the same thing and whether they're ready for the changeover. I think, um, you know, so this, I became aware of this um, at the just before Christmas, so um, we're not ready right now, um, but we are looking to see what we can do to get ready for it. Um, you know, and it's because we still have the information as it is, you know, it's not our systems will stop working, but we won't be able to update them until we can ingest, you know, the new information. Either we have it converted to latitude longitude for us, either internally or externally, or we you know, build it into our system and pull in Eastings and Northings. Um, but yeah, until, uh, you know, so stopping it will mean that we can't consume any updates very quickly um, until we until we fix it, um, but it won't stop everything working overnight. Okay, that's interesting. I'm, I'm mainly asking because we consume a lot of data uh, provided from uh, likes of yourselves of VIX and Ticketer. So we, we're now doing our own conversion. And uh, the main concern of ours is that we might be doing it differently. This is one of the reasons that I wanted to have this conversation was to ensure that if we do a conversion, we agree on what we convert from and to and all of those things. Also, I didn't know that the Ordnance Survey way of doing things had been deprecated. Um, so let's also, this is also one of the other pieces that we tackle a little bit further on is all the different maps and mapping systems that, that are used, which also comes up. So let's run on to John Arney. Uh, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, I represent uh, one of the constituencies, the ETO world. We are a large scale consumer of data for the UK as well as uh, internationally. And we do supply Google uh, with a lot of their data as well related to this. And yes, uh, WGS84 is the standard uh, sort of conversion that we apply. So we definitely are a consumer of, of that data. The, you know, the thing that occurs to me in, in this conversation about supplying Eastings and Northings and latitude, longitude, um, if, if we're in a position where we're entertaining the proposition that several hundred local authorities provide that data, then we're in a situation where potentially we have easting northings and latitude longitude, and we're not really sure which one is correct. And I think the concern that I would have is that if, if we would sort of be in a position of choosing, should I look at eastings and northings or should I look at latitude and longitude and that decision might be different for a hundred and some different uh, different authorities. So I think in in any system, if you're looking for, uh, you know, if, if you have redundancies in your data, and this would be an example of a redundancy in the data, you have multiple representations. 
um, you're always in that position of realizing that they are going to become inconsistent over time, particularly when you have multiple suppliers of that data. So, you know, I, I think what I would look for as an outcome is a, a very unambiguous decision of this is the data element that is the source of truth that we would all agree on and that latitude and longitude would be or other other representations of that data i shouldn't shouldn't predispose the answer uh, should be derived from uh, whatever that is in one place not in 140 places on the consumer side and also not in hundreds of places on the uh, consumer side. In other words, somebody's going to have to do that conversion. Is it going to be 100 suppliers of data? Is it going to be 50 consumers of data? Or is it going to be in one place that everybody can sort of trust? I would vote for the, the simplest option with the fewest number of times that data gets converted, that being a centralized source. That's a really good point, and thank you for that. I think you explain the situation really well, and that's one of the options that we can consider. Um, but I also agree that there needs to be an agreement that there is, if there's one type, Eastings, Northings seems to be what everyone supplies, that that's considered the canonical wear of a bus stop, and everything else is derived from that piece of data rather than, um, so if there's a disagreement between the latitude, longitude, and the Eastings, Northings, then we know which one is the bestestest of them. Um, the, the, final, the final thing that I wanted to bring up, sorry not to extend this too long, but the final thing that I wanted to bring up is even with the Eastings and Northings, ITO have become aware of several situations where we are provided Eastings and Northings marked in the Irish grid, uh, However, they're not actually in the Irish grid, they're actually in the UK grid. And yeah. so even with just that, there's an awful lot of ambiguity as the source of truth. Uh, John, there is one instance, there is one ally that has that problem. They're about to migrate systems and we're working with them to ensure that they indicate their grid correctly. So we- Thank you. That's a huge help. Yeah. yeah, I just thought I just thought I'd let you know, I don't wanna name name the local authority because they've been doing things that they thought was the right things for a, a large number of years and old NAPTAN was hiding that problem from everybody and it's only when we're looking at their raw data that we uncovered that they had a mismatch in their system. They're about to migrate to a new system and we're going to work with them to make sure that as part of that migration the small mistake gets cleared up. Um, we can say that everybody should be on the UK, everyone is using the UK grid. Thank you. Uh, John Wicks, let's yes, hear from more, you. Uh, something I'm looking at is, so we're, we're changing over to a new scheduling system, which is based on Google Maps. So everything in there is in that long. Um, and obviously, if, if we're then going to have to output stuff in Northings and Easterns, which are not in that system, um, we need to understand really what we need to do with that data. Um, and what impact that's going to have because everything on on the, the new system we're using is driven by Google. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what people think we'd need to do with that. I, I'm hopefully John Avery and other people can help us um, and Neil can also help us pull out exactly what people should be doing as a conversion and we agree on that best practice conversion and that that to me would be a great outcome from today even if there's other things that that could come from that. Um, Roger Court. Um, hi, just to um, echo everything that John said in his, his very cogent um, few minutes there. Um, we're also in the position of having systems that rely on lap long. Um, and of course, having those drop out, especially since um, London isn't providing lap longs. Um, and if an organization like TFL can't do it, um, really, you know, you, you sort of wonder um, how we can expect anybody else to. Um, that's going to give us huge problems. I'm basically going to have to refactor a lot of code in order to calculate this, um, which is going to be particularly irritating if we then start providing that data again. Um, 
The argument that we should have a single source of truth, I completely agree with, um, and I would militate there for um, um, Eastings and Northings to be the way that we should go. And the reason for that is that it makes sense on the ground and gives you a sense of scale. Um, if two Eastings are five metres apart from each or five points apart from each other, you know it's five metres on the ground and vice versa. You have no such instinctive um, sense of how far apart two latitudes or two longitudes are. Thank you, Roger. And I think that's taking a really good perspective on this as well. And that's the next bit we're going to come up to is where do we measure? What are we measuring? What is a stop? And I know that's going to sound precise and pedantic to some people, but it it, it will make a difference to a lot of people as to where you where you start the measurement from and where you place it. So I just kind of, I'll touch on that in the next one, but I think you made some really good points there. Um, Darcy. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi yeah, hi there. I just wanted to um, <clears throat> say that um, I, I also agree with the single source of truth. However, even if we do that, um, we, we all need to know what the common standard methodology is for translation, um, because um, we, like someone else said, we, we get longitude, we get data from other sources as well. Um, and my, my, my main point here is I, I think I wonder whether, you know, um, we we could utilise um, the audit survey themselves as a government organisation or to or even Google um, to to provide assistance or advice or, or consult on, on this matter, um, who are undoubtedly the experts in um, all things coordinates. Absolutely. And I think that it could be very well be part of the follow up. Um, part of today was to really understand everyone's perspectives, because we know that this has been questions that have been asked of us quite a few times. And rather than doing lots of individual one to one conversations, we thought it was better to have a really big open conversation about <clears throat> what this is and then figure out what the next step should be rather than coming in with a solution because I we didn't understand the problems yet. Um, so let's go to Chris Sherry. Hello, I just wanted to come and reinforce what Dar Darcy said and just also say that the Eastings and Northings, assuming that everyone is using the same type of Eastings and Northings, are based on OSGB 36. The 36 stands for 1936. Um, so it's kind of a traditional datum. Uh, but I believe OSM are now using OSG uh, M15, which is from 2015, which is a more modern one, which takes into account continental drift, changes in gravity, things like that. So if the plan is to use, um, uh, to, it, if the plan is to use um, East things and North things still, you know, we need to make sure we're using the same, the same datum for that. Let us also raise that one. Um, that might be a very technical question to ask of some of some of the people who are doing the surveying of bus stops. Uh, I don't know how much continental drift has impacted on the location of bus stops recently. Uh, it's about, um, oh, sorry, I've got it in my notes here. Um, it's moved by about uh, 100 metres and it moves once, uh, about a metre every year. Oh, wow. That's actually quite significant. I didn't realise it was quite such a significant move in the UK. Uh, I, I'm, I come from... I'm not an expert on this. I've been researching it. Um, but from, from what I've read recently, um, it moves about a metre every year. Let us, uh, let us get somebody from Ordnance Survey in in the next in the next round of these to talk to talk through how how we would need to what we would need to do to move those eastings northings and and we can start looking at the, that impact as well but thank you chris um also coming from new zealand i'm used to continental drift of no movement oh we've suddenly moved 10 meters in a ginormous earthquake is kind of the more new zealand style of, of continental drift i believe um darcy no sorry i i i um I haven't um, dropped my hand. <laughs> ah, legacy I, hand. I haven't re raised it. I, I don't know why. Um, it's, it's That's not... okay. Uh, Jared Butler. Right, yeah. Um, so I'm building on Roger's point because I know TFO work were mentioned explicitly. Um, just really wanted to um, amplify one of the points he made that, that having an actual 
Easting and North thing, which we are using, will continue to do so. It does help with the visual representation and sense of context because probably 85% of the changes that I'm making to bus stops in London aren't name changes or new stops or withdrawals. They're physical movements of stops. So having that sort of sense of, you know, they're looking at numbers, having a sort of a, admittedly, a fairly general sense of the amount to which a stop has moved is, is absolutely essential. So, you know, we would continue to support the case for Eastings and Northings. Um, but the greatest amount of respect is it's all very well for consumers to say we want this done from source or we want that done from source. I'm not necessarily saying anyone on the call has said that. But as I say, even if I wasn't keen on Eastings and Northings, that is a massive work project. And frankly, there isn't necessarily the money there to actually justify or do it. And I don't want to speak for other data providers, but I'll, I'll, I'll be bold to suggest that, uh, the, you know, that would be the case for many other people. It's all very well for consumers to complain and gripe about stuff that they don't have to pay for with the greatest amount of respect. Thank you, Jared. And yeah, um, one of the things of, I and I think that point of Eastings, Northings, that you can visualise it in your mind of, if I take three steps my i know three steps in this direction i know my i know my coordinates have changed and i can almost i i can physically measure it is i think such a big thing for people on the ground um let's go through i'd like to move on to the next part so i'm going to in 10 minutes time move on to the next piece where we talk about accuracy and precision but we'll i'm enjoying this conversation i think it's really good to have this out uh so lee dandy Thank you. Um, my first comment was perhaps more to do with um, precision, so maybe I'm a little bit early, but I, I was going to say that with the Eastings and Northings, um, in our data management system, they are specified with one decimal place. So you actually split that meter by meter box into, into um, what would that be, 10 centimetres by 10 yep. by 10. Um, but when it gets exported as uh, NAPTAN, that gets rounded up or down. So in the worst case scenario, if your bus stops in the middle of that metre by metre square, it'll actually get rounded up by 50 centimetres in both directions, which if you then work out the, um, um, the, the overall movement, it's about 71 centimetres it would have moved. So obviously there is an issue about whether or not you have decimal places with the Eastings Northings. Um, and my other point was that just to complicate matters even more, there is an option to actually specify the location of the stop, not based purely on any sort of grid, um, but rather you specify how far away it is from the centre line of the road um, based on, is that called ITN data? I'm not sure what that's called, but you know where the road is, you say it's three, three and a half metres away from the road so if somebody actually moves the road in the in the relevant data set the bus stop moves with it so that's just a bit of a complication I wanted to also mention. That's an interesting complication and I think we'll definitely get to both of your points when we talk about accuracy and precision and I think you've brought up a really good point there. Um, can I just quickly ask which system you're on that is allowing you to put in a decimal point but removing it when it exports to NAPTAN? Uh, that's Novus FX from Trapeze. Cool. Um, right, Adrian Glover. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, can we just clarify something for me? I'm not sure if I've missed something. Earlier on in the conversation, you said that uh, if a local authority or any other data supplier sends you information where fields are missing or blank, you don't add that information in. So if, for example, we're going to use, let us say, Easting and Northing as the source of truth, is the NAPTAN system going to generate the latitude and longitude for those appropriate fields? The reason this might be important is because there are many third party app developers out there that develop real time apps for bus users that work basically off of Google layers of latitude and longitude. Could we end up with a situation where vast areas that are only using uh, Easting and Northings don't get real-time information through those third-party apps? 
Um, that's the situation we're trying to avoid, Adrian. So what was happening previously was the inside the database, the system was rewriting the latitude longitude um, if, it if it wasn't there, but sometimes it was also overwriting uh, and overwriting possibly an incorrect and overwriting incorrectly. What we've said is we're not going to put out data that we're not receiving. Um, that's a respect at source, change at source decision. Now, if we need to change that decision, that's something that we can arrive to in this meeting and we'll take it through and we'll and we'll take it through some governance and really understand the impact of this. But what we've said is everyone's giving us Eastings Northings. Some are giving us latitude, longitude. We're not going to overwrite and we're also not going to fill in if somebody's not provided it. And this is a, across a whole pile of fields, not just latitude, longitude, but that's the one that's had the biggest impact of making that decision. So we're trying to understand the impact of that decision on people, to understand what is the best way forward, and if there's an agreement on the best way forward across everybody. Because we don't want to do work that other people are going to be doing. We don't want to put extra burdens on people, but we also want everyone to be, if you're converting, to be converting in the same way. So that there isn't the possibility of somebody doing a conversion in a totally different way and having real-time information that doesn't represent the right bus stops. I think you've brought up a really interesting impact that we would need to consider in this. Ryan, you're up next. Um, hey, I just wanted to um, raise a couple of points. Um, the first one was um, based on the person who said, you know, data consumers aren't paying for this. Um, data consumers pay for this every single day. We have hundreds of support requests for where end users, you know, think that the bus a bus stop is in a certain location and it ends up being, you know, on the opposite side of the road or, you know, meters and meters away. So there is an ongoing cost to data consumers to make sure that, you know, the data that they're consuming is correct and that their conversion process is correct. If it's um, the data set is missing data, it in, from my perspective, it doesn't make any sense for you know 200 odd suppliers to attempt to all convert it the same way. That that's it's just not going to happen. At least one person is going to do it differently. It makes more sense for you know a single authority to try and do the conversion. And if that authority can't do the conversion correctly, then I'd argue you know who can. Um, the the only other other thing I wanted to say was if you're going to uh, if audit survey or whoever is actually collecting the un underlying data and they're doing it in a, in a particular uh, format on a particular datum, I would question why they're using a datum that's itself deprecated by um, audit survey. And it, if audit survey are mandating that they you have to use that particular um, format, then they they themselves should be able to provide a reference implementation so that it can be done in a single consistent way by a single person. Uh, okay, tackling the second one first. I don't think Ordnance Survey are telling us to use the old system or the new system. I just think literally NAPTAN schema and the systems have not been updated. It is now it is old enough to take for a pint. So yes, but the think Eastings and Northings are old enough to be dead at this point. <laughs> oh yes, no, Eastings and Northings old enough to be dead. But when the new standard came out in 2015, nobody thought to update. NAP10, nobody, there's been no plan to update everybody, which is why everyone's still on the old system, because that's a system that everyone's inputting systems, all the local authorities have been using. So let's take which which Eastings Northings, just put that to one side and we'll we'll have a look at that and we'll come back. We obviously need to run more of these. Um, we did run a couple on mapping, but obviously we didn't ask the right questions of people. So we're going to put that off to one side and have a look at what would be the what would be the cost to local authorities of moving from one Eastings Northings to another Eastings Northings on their systems. That's one that's one point. The other point was around the conversions. That's part of what we're trying to understand today. That's part of what we're trying to understand the impact of not having these in. Now, we were converting incorrectly to a degree of accuracy that wasn't correct either. We were we were over representing the accuracy of the Eastings Northings. So we were being given stuff that was one meter to 10 meters um, and of accuracy. And we were producing to decimal places that was down to a couple of centimeters across. So we were over precising 
what the conversions we weren't con we weren't converting correctly and in some cases with this very old database there was stuff that was going awry and we've discovered that and that's part of what we've been cleaning up we've done a lot of data cleansing within naptan over the last year or so since i've been on here does that help brian um yeah it, it, it gives some historical context i would just say that you know um Again, it, if it's a if it's a deprecated standard from 2014, then it, it it's not going to be any anybody who builds an app in you know 2022 is not going to be using Eastings and Northings as their core coordinate system. They're going to be using latitude and longitude. And uh, I imagine moving forward, Ordnance Survey would like you know people to stop using the older deprecated standard, or they wouldn't have deprecated it. So I don't think we long term should be trying to base everything off of Eastings and Northings. I think we should be trying to at least follow the guidance from the people who created the standards so that, that are telling us to no longer use them. Then, yeah, and I totally agree there. However, NAP10 has not been updated since 2002. We, we can't even get people, everyone who's a local authority, to move to the 2000, and I think it's 2008 standard of 2.4. So even getting people to upgrade to the standard that was released in 2008 is going to be difficult. So this is part of the future of NAPTAM, which we're going to be looking at as to what needs to happen, what, what funding needs to perhaps be provided, and what is the impact on the system of this stuff not happening. And this is one of those impacts. So thank you for bringing that forward. I think it's really good. Right. We've got three more minutes on this before I move on because I really, we really do need to move on. I'm going to go to Andy. If you're, if you've got any questions about accuracy or precision, we are going to cover that in a few minutes. So, Andy. Yes, just a quick one, I promise. Um, someone mentioned about the converting uh, our system, which holds the the base data. Obviously, is actually based on a different coordinate system anyway, and we export in Eastings and Northings. Um, so the lat long is made from the same data and we don't store Eastings and Northings, we store it in a different format and everything's converted from it. So there's a conversion in an ex every, every export anyway. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about and conversions, you have to think about what the base data is based on. Andy, can I ask what you store it in in the first place? Because I didn't know there was another system. But again, I'm also somebody who doesn't know where Bristol is. Um, it is stored. I believe actually it's in the database in, in the TFLV version, which is based on the Navtech system, which Gerard would actually probably be able to explain better. Uh, it was originally based on an east, a type of Easting and Northing, but it's not, if that makes sense. OK. Um, but we can I, export in about 45 different standards around the world. <laughs> which is great. Let's agree on the right standard to export it. Um, Mark. Hi, yeah. Um, I think I was going to say, I had a few points earlier on, but they got covered. Um, I think most local authorities have used Eastings and Northerns because we were bound or we were implemented with the Ordnance Survey license across sort of most of our systems. So that's why we've always had Eastings and Northerns anyway. Uh, and then I put in the chat there saying, well, if you say all local authorities are supplying Eastings and Northerns, why don't you, why doesn't the NAPTAN tool then just take these into Northerns for any uploads and then uh, NAPTAN as a whole just convert into lat long in its own one concise thing? And as someone said, that you're not getting hundreds of people uh, trying to do the conversions and potentially getting it wrong and go into different decimal places. That is an option, and we'll come back to that. But um, thank you for that. And um, Chris Burkett, you're the last person who's going to talk on this. Oh, thank you. I was just going to say that, you know, as a local authority, we are heavily invested in working with the Ordnance Survey because this has been going back um, contractually over a number of years. Um, we're not suddenly going to turn around and work with Google because we're not allowed to. Um, and um, 
we we've uh, we work with um, the the Eastings and Northings, and they're not deprecated. Eastings and Northings have never been deprecated um, because if you work with the current licensed uh, version of the the Ordnance Survey Master Maps, it's built in, it's baked in. So Eastings and Northings are fairly well straight, you know, straightforward and universal. Um, also, I have recently, well, I've recently over the last five years. Um, baked in some um, conversion factors to the WGS84 format for working with bus real-time information, which is uh, the, the, the GPS system is, is um, uh, has the WGS84 uh, datum baked into it, and which is where there's a such uh, uh, a sort of widespread and universal take up of this. But local authorities, as far as I'm concerned, will continue to work with the Eastings and Northings and the, the current datum for the Ordnance Survey, as far as I'm aware, because that's all that's available to us. Cool. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And that is uh, a piece that we need to consider is that one side contractually is only allowed to work with Ordnance Survey. So the data producers, the data consumers uh, uh, don't have that don't have that limitation. So how do we make this work? So I'm going to quick. I'm going to go and not quickly. I'm going. We we're going to go and we're going to have just a quick discussion on precision because one of the things I want to understand is um, where do you mark the stop? Because this is something that's come up a couple of times the last few, the last couple of times that I ran this. So those who've seen my diagrams before will note that it's a lovely redrawn diagram with the markings on the road as well and the curb. So one of the things that we need to understand is where is the stop? Because <laughs> that differs and that leads to um, that needs to be precise enough that the ticketing systems and the real time information systems and the voice announcey systems uh, and the systems on screen systems all know when you've arrived at a stop and when you've left a stop. And so they need to know where that stop is within a certain boundary. So I just wanted to quickly ask the question, hopefully it's going to be quite short, is what is the point that marks the stop? Have we agreed on that when we start to talk precision? Is it the pole where the stop is? Is it the road and the signs in the bay? Is it an arbitrary middling point between that? Where is where does the stop actually exist? So, Chris, I think you've got a legacy hand up, so we'll go to Lee Dandy as the first person there. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think um, when people are thinking about this and not um, being too precise about it, I think in, in day to day life, we think about the pole as being the stop. Uh, obviously, if you look, if you start talking about unmarked stops where there is no pole, obviously you've then got a, an imaginary invisible pole. Um, so that's a bit of a difficult one. Um, for me, I think the, the point where you stand in front of the doors, where the doors open and that, that piece of curb between you and the driver, that to me, that is where the stop is because you physically step onto the bus at that point. Um, there's an argument that you should that most buses attract using a, a electronic ticket machine, an ETM, which is positioned to the left hand side of the driver, and that probably has a GPS transponder somewhere. So you, there's a there's an argument to say that the where the ETM machine is would be a good place to have the stop because then when the bus came to a halt, if it if it was exactly precise, then the difference between that ETM machine and then the physical location at that time stop would be zero. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think, I think generally people think it's the pole, basically. Thank you. I think I so so as a consumer, that's where I think of it being. Oh, so as a bus passenger, that's where I think of it being. It's kind of like to the right hand side of the pole when you're in in London, because that's where the bus door usually opens. Um, although sometimes it's on the other side because big long bus stops. Um, Trisha. Yeah, I was going to say that the original schema guidelines were that it was where the bus stop pole is um, purely for the fact that sometimes you can have two buses at the stop. So if you had it where the doors open, um, 
historically um, where shelters have been placed, you can't necessarily put raised curbs in the right places. And so, you know, and some some stops don't have poles, some don't have shelters. So you kind of just have to look at, well, if I put it here, will somebody know that's where the bus stop is? Um, so, but we try and use the pole or the street lighting column if that's where the flag has been put on or, you know, the village post box if that is the is is that the start we try and use that as the point this is coming to um one of the future things that i we're working on which is the illustrated guide to bus stops the little ladybird illustrated guide to bus stops almost where we're trying to describe all these different stops and get agreement across all the different local authorities of how that stop is represented in the data because there's some little oddities that have happened over the years that people are doing in slightly different ways and we just need to understand and ensure that everybody is mm. starts to move towards doing it representing it in the same way and mm. i think trisha you're definitely one of the people we're going to grab for that wonderful adventure yeah. well one of the things that we have in nottinghamshire are things called flexible zones because we have demand responsive transport um, and so we have chosen the village bus stop as the point of the centre point of where that flexible zone is before the, we then draw the polygon around the rest of the village to say if you live here you can phone for a bus um but yeah we still try and use the the actual bus stop as the main identifier for the flexible zones as well that's that's really super to know um so we've kind of got a bit of agreement that the pole is the pole the pole is the stop even if the stop is slightly uh, in front or behind the pole um adrian uh, yes, I was just going to say all of the things that have just been said. Actually, as far as the passenger is concerned, it's where the door opens that is where the bus stops. And it's in the name, isn't it? Bus stop, that's where the bus stops. However, all of that depends on having a standard bus stop design. And not all bus stops are the same. There are some where the topography of the land means you can't put the pole exactly where you'd like to. The shelter isn't exactly where you'd want it either. The callous raised curbs aren't quite right either. Oh, and you get that awkward situation of very busy stops where three or four buses arrive and all their doors are in different places and yet they're at the same bus stop. Absolutely. And that's part of the different situations that we need to be aware of when we're defining a bus stop. Um, one of the original answers when we came up with what is a bus stop, um, the answer was a bus stop is where the bus stops, which I thought was particularly precise and informative. Yeah. Um, those are complications we need to take into account when we're trying to describe a bus stop. But I think the pole still is kind of, if we agree that the pole is where the stops is centred, for the most part, that seems to be an OK go. Or Adrian, do you want to come back to that one before I continue on down the rest of the list of hands up? Do remember that some shelters have the pole on the roof. Some, some, <laughs> Sometimes the pole isn't the right thing, but in, as a general principle, that's, that's the start of it. Um, Chris Burkett. Hello, yes, I'm going to advocate that the correct point for a bus stop is the absolute departure end of the bus stop area. Mm -hmm. And this will sit quite nicely with those that say this is where the bus doors open. It's got to be the departure end. Um, for many years, I was marking bus stops in the middle of the shelter. But then we had several requests from um, partners in Stagecoach, um, the Go Ahead group, where we've had um, real-time information. And we've got quite a long bus stop. And if you park, if you if you have the, the bus stop marked in the middle of that, that bus stopping area, with GPS wobble, the buses are marked up as having passed the stop early. So since that time, I have always marked the bus stop location as far as possible at the departure end of the bus stop, whether it be a lay-by or, or uh, 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 the the cage marked on the road and whatever. Um, it is also where, you know, technically the passengers have to board and alight. It may not be possible to put the bus stop flag there. Um, so we've always gone, I have always gone, 
Oxfordshire has always gone with the departure end of the bus stop as being the location of that bus stop for technical reasons. That's that's really good, and I like the precision of that. Um, and I think that uh, I, I I see that Holly's written that down. Um, let's move on to Sean. Um, yeah, so coming from the the, the data consumer end, um, one of the things in the GTFS specification is it does specifically um, kind of state in terms of the kind of stops should be around where the the bus pole is if it exists, or otherwise where the travellers um, are boarding the vehicle. Um, and not on the, the roadway or the track that the, the vehicle is on. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think it's agreeing with um, uh, what other people are saying of, of it being at the, the, the pole. I just see that Holly's had a crash out of the meeting for some reason. Adrian, are you OK to share your screen for me? Uh, I'm asking Adrian Falconer. If not, yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to attempt to do it. Thank you very down. much. The six windows I've got looking at ordnance survey degradations. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I think Holly is still in the mural marking things up. Uh, so um, who is next on the uh, list? Sorry, one. Sorry, uh, yeah, sorry, one. Uh, yeah, sorry, one other point, and that is around kind of rail as well. So we uh, we also use the uh, the NAPTAN data for um, rail. Uh, locations, um, so that's uh, and, and and ferry points as well. Um, so that's certainly um, some th you know, another kind of aspect of the NAPTAN data that uh, hasn't been mentioned so far um, is rail and ferry. I've avoided mentioning rail because we have the right number of rail stations and three platforms. Um, we know that there is some work to clean up the rail the rail data within NAPTAN um, and um that's something that we've got on the long list of things to do yeah excellent thanks uh tess howard hello um so with some work we've been doing on bods recently we've been starting to talk a bit about accessibility and and who who's the data for um and something i think might be useful to think of here is how, how's that data being used by that end passenger at the very end moment for me i'm able-bodied so if i'm not in quite the right place i can use my eyes and my legs to go to where the appropriate location is but i think maybe we might also want to consider who's going to be using this data to the most accurate and precise need so whether that's you can't you know some sort of disability whether you're trying to be a wheelchair user I actually don't know whether a wheelchair user gets on at the front or the departure part of a bus or where that might be, but I think it might be something we want to consider that at the most precise and accurate moment, the person who needs it most. I think that's a really good point, Tess. However, I think that also differs by bus and by bus type. Yeah. Um, I'm a stick. I'm a stick user, and I know that some buses in London, I would almost use one of the middle doors to get on when they've got the yeah. ramp down. Whereas other buses of a slightly different type, stopping at the same stop, need me to get on the front because they don't have a middle door. So there's a lot of complications there, and okay. I think that accessibility is something that we're looking at as to how we represent the accessibility of a stop in NAPTAN. And I know that there's a whole thing around representing the accessibility of a bus in BODS because accessibility is an interaction yeah. between those two pieces. So let's move that to one side, yeah. but I think Another you place, made a really great point there. Uh, John Wicks, you're the next person up. Yeah, I, one thing I was sort of thinking about is we're, we're talking about bus stops and, and placing the, the point on the flag, which is on the pavement. But could we not offset it so it's always in the roadway next to the pavement? Because what happens when we're mapping a bus route um, is it will, you know, the, the measurement for the mileage will go onto the pavement and back off. Now, it's not very much. It's a metre here, a metre there. But when you're running hundreds of trips a day, that adds up. So it'd be more accurate to actually have it at the point along the pavement where the flag is, but actually in the road. And a so, lot of that stops are not they're on the pavement so this is one of the points that we need to put forward i think chris burkett came up with the uh was such a good thing of it's the exit end 
of the bay of the cage on the of the cage i believe is the markings on the road where the bus stops so it's the exit part of that but i think there is something that we need to discuss and agree on that local authorities all say this is the point where we put our bus stop because mm. Everyone, this is one of the things that we're uncovering is the 140 or so people who put, or local authorities who've put their data into NAPTAD have 140 odd ways of working around the systems. And yeah. we're just trying to get everyone onto, okay, this is the way that works best. This is the gold standard that we're gonna try to get towards. And it might take some time, but we're gonna get aimed to getting towards this. Does that yeah, make no, sense, John? Yeah, that, that would work for me. Obviously, you know, if we've got buses on a pavement, we're doing something wrong. So you know, <laughs> stop on the road. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, Dr. J, can I just jump in on a reply to that? Uh which sure. I just put, I just put in a comment then. Uh dif different mapping programs for uh making all your bus routes and stuff have different road links, like ordnance survey from the ITN links to the highways whichever they've on now, OSM road links, the ones that were in trapeze, they're all on slightly different lines. So we've had bus stops when we was, say if we've mapped it on a it, on an OS road link, and then we mapped it in a, using an OSM data set, the road link had, had moved slightly and it looked like the bus stop was on the other side of the road. So this that, is one you know, of the if, things if you're, that... try, if, you're try, if you're trying to put it right on the on your road link for a, a mapping program um it's always going to slightly deviate i mean you might you might have a road that's six lanes wide but you'll still only have one line down the middle of it i've totally got you mark and this is one of the things i've got a little example um of, off to the right and i don't think we're going to get to it with the speed of pace of our discussion because our discussion has been really good but there's a whole area around where this goes wrong just using one example um which was basically outside one of my work colleagues houses um so of it being mapped in different places and different ways of different things and i think you've given us the how that happens or why that happens what we want to look at is what can we do as data providers to make it easier for everybody so that they understand if i use this these are the things i need to be aware of if i use this data this mapping system these are the things that could that could happen and just help people make the most of the data we're providing does that make sense mark and john yeah sorry yeah me. Um, me. sweet Right, I mean, moving. also as the local authority, we'll always just put it on the pavement, you know, because well, we, we, we won't be able to conform to every other single bit of and this uh, comes down program. To, and this comes down to Tess's, to, te, to the point that Tess made. Um, are we m marking the bus stop for the passenger or for the bus? Because if it's for the passenger, I want to know where I stand and where I physically put myself and if we're marking it for the bus, that might actually be a couple of metres distant from where I should be standing. You don't want me standing in the middle of the road waiting for my waiting for the right bus. So let's have a think about that as well when we conceptualise some of this. Um, Ian Barrett. Hi, uh, just picking up on this, just listening to this, the, the mapping, we've been in, down this road before, because if you go back to previous meetings, I raised the query with Stagecoach because of the mapping software they used, and we had the same stop but in a different place according to the road we're not as a local authority we're not going to put bus stops in the road because to follow it through are we asking the passenger to step it stand on the road to catch the bus clearly not what it comes about is there's got to be some sort of sense of tolerances and reasonableness about this because we're all doing it as you say 140 different ways but we'll put a bus stop on a on a lamp column so actually it depends where the lamp column is and we're doing that we'll have a shelter and the, the lamp column might be a meter away and that's where the bus stop flag is but you're going to stand by the shelter so where we had the similar issues going back quite a while when we were one of the early real-time providers is where the clear down was and this was always an issue with the system that we had at the time is where the bus clears down to say it's gone past that stop and it updates the the, the screen so we're not going to come up this group with yeah this is precisely where the stop is we'll put it where we think it is and we've done the measurements but it's not going to fit in with everybody else's view on this so some downstream systems 
are going to have to build in some sort of tolerances. Because if that physically where the stop is, that's where it's going to be marked. And your systems are going to have to take account of that somebody might have to walk 20 metres down because there's three buses there. And you're going to have to deal with that because that's a fact of life of what happens in the operations of public transport. So, Ian, I think you make a great point. And this is part, I, I, I think this is part of what we're trying to do is just get those different viewpoints of the people who produce the data and why it's produced and the people who consume the data. And I think your point about tolerances is probably going to be one of those pieces that helps us kind of bring out us and come to an agreement, a golden way forward that matches, allows both sides to get what they need from the system without compromising their main goals. Um, Tony Sirio. Hello there. Yeah. Apologise any ignorance of subject. I've been in the public transport realm for a short period of time now, but um, common sense dictates to me as well um, from, from some infrastructure projects I've already been involved in, especially in more rural locations, that we've got occasions where we've got shelters that we cannot put near where the embankment point near the road is. The flag is and in the bus stop is sitting, the flag is sitting on the shelter. Um, again, going back to Ian's points around tolerances, is this more about the GPS and the, and, and, the, and the machines within the bus actually understanding that when I get within 20 metres of that location, 30 metres of that location, I talk to the RTI and say I'm arriving when I get 20 metres past that. So I think it's tolerances are very important because um, I, I guess in cities and in towns, you can very, be very specific where you want to put your stops. You start getting to the more rural locations, it's not working out nearly the same. Um, so really, I think it was, uh, Ian covered it quite nicely, but just to move on from that, I think tolerances around how um, tickets are in the machines and the GPS um, and geofencing around the locations might be something to discuss further. I think that's a really good point and we'll I would like to build that up to a kind of working group recommendation of this is the tolerances, these are, this is the way we produce the data, these are the ways that we suggest the data is consumed and this is the tolerances between it is going to be a really good way forward. Um, I am based in London, so I do have a slightly London centric view of bus stops, but I'm aware even in London, it's sometimes difficult to get the shelter, the pole and where the bus stops aligned and I, I know that's only a couple of metres, not 20 metres, but when you go more rural, the shelter, A, might not be there, but also might be a good couple of metres down the road because that's historically where the shelter was, even if the bus stops moved and, and is now in a slightly more safer place for the bus to stop at. Um, Adrian Glover. Um, all the conversations that we've just been having have actually sort of led us to the conclusion that bus stop means different things for different people. But the main thing for passengers is they're walking along a pavement. Where do I wait for my bus? We're talking about pole. We shouldn't be. We should be talking about the flag because the flag might be on a lamp column. It might be on the top of the shelter or it may indeed be on a pole. So somebody trying to identify on foot where the bus stop is will be looking for the flag. And that is where the, the bus stop is as far as they're concerned. The driver of said vehicle should then stop at that point so that the bus stop is fulfilled and the door is as close to intending passengers as possible. And then there almost needs to be a datum line across the departure end or the front end of the bus box, which ideally should also be where the flag is, so that all those coordinates are the same. Having them be the same would be lovely. I think there's a couple of metres of tolerance there because yeah, I know, yeah. I, I yeah, know yeah. that the tickety boxy thing that registers where the bus is is yeah. at least a meter or so on the bus so there's going to be some tolerances and i think but i think you make a great point i've always but when i've talked poll i've meant the thing with the with the word bus stop on and that could be the pole the flag and i think calling it the flag is the really important point um Andy, let's go to you, and then I'm going to move down to the this notion of what is what is accuracy and how accurate and precise do we need to be. Um, but Andy, I'd love your last words on this. Okay, again, it's just hopefully just a quick one. 
or a couple of ones. Uh, people are saying about 140 suppliers. There's probably not 140 suppliers. There's local authorities of those 140, but they only use about three or four different systems in the main. So as long as those systems are doing it the same way, and each of those, you know, those people are being guided by the same people, it will be roughly the same way. Um, also, when we're looking at changing the accuracy and the, and the locations of these uh, stops, don't forget we've got hundreds of thousands of stops already in the systems. You know, if we if we change or if we look at changing the way the local authorities are supposed to record these, there are a lot of work to audit those mm -hmm. stops and then get those stops changed in the system, which the DFT are very unlikely to fund. This is why I wanted to discuss that as part of the future of NAPTAN and just look at um, what needs to happen to make some of the stuff work. Um, Andy, I think you're, um, I appreciate that there are only three or four different suppliers of data. I do know that people on the same systems, not not yours because you, yours is a little more under control at times, but there are people on the same systems who are doing things in slightly different ways. Um, even just the way that they record things. And I'm also aware for those who have uncovered it, that there are some some weird esoteric points. And I will say that a hail and ride stop can be marked, um, but the schema strictly doesn't allow that. But there are marked hail and ride stops within TFL within London. Um, so we need to sit down and have a look at what represents best what's on the ground, not what makes pretty data, because pretty data, if it doesn't represent what's on the ground for a user, ain't going to be that good. And that moves on to the next point, which is around precision and accuracy. Now, I've tried to draw. I'm just going to summon everybody. I've tried to draw. <sighs> the, as best as I can. So the little red dot is where the bus stops where the door opens and all of those things. And I know that it's slightly away from the pole, but that was for the ability for me to draw this and fit it on very nicely. So we have a nice accurate square that's a meter by a meter that is exactly where we want it to be. We have a sort of accurate 10 meters by 10 meters, which is kind of the next, I think it's the next level up on Eastings and Northings because it works in, and then we also have this 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter square, which is super precise but isn't accurate, isn't it exactly where it should be. Now, I just wanted to understand from people, and especially the consumers, what level of accuracy do you think you need? Because that is, <laughs> there's a big difference between a 10 meter square and a 10 centimeter square. The one meter square seems to be pretty much where we sit at the moment, but I wanted to make sure, because I know I understand that if we go to self-propelling, self-steering, autonomous vehicle type things, um, this needs to be a heck, they can't deal with one meter square, that's way too inaccurate for them, and they want much more details. Um, wanted to understand what people's thoughts were on this, and just make sure that if we're going to guide people towards the standard, we guide them towards the one that's sane and sensible. So. Roger, your hand went straight up straight away and you're at the top of the Jay, class, so off you I, go. Can I just interrupt quickly and just ask, can everyone write on the mural? Um, th I think the chat is working, which is not normal. Um, but the, uh, um, Jay, have you got down the mural? You only. Um, uh, I write only. They can't. Okay. I didn't purposefully lock down the mural. Give me two seconds to go and ensure that people can get on there and, and leave notes on there because it would be, but I'm, that's also one of the reasons why we've taken on running these because that way we can we can run the chat, which was uh, um, when Tim Rivett from RTIG was kind enough to run these for us, um, we couldn't have the chat running. So it's been good for us to have that chat there. Just give me two seconds to make sure that I have set this up correctly. No, I haven't. I forgot, I didn't notice that I'd done that mistake. You should all now have the ability to add stickies to the system. Um, I just for interrupting, you... but thank you. No problems, thanks for letting me know, Adrian. I'd, I'd miss that and the setup. Roger, you're at the top of the list, top of the, top of the class. Again. Hello yeah. again. Yes, as you probably guess, I've got opinions on this. Um, 
it, it's coming down more to level of precision than level of accuracy. There is a, a limit, I think, to how accurate we can be due to the limitations on accuracy um, provided by GPS systems, which is usually what um, crews on the ground are using to locate the assets present at a bus stop. Um, they're not going out um, with the full theodolite and surveyor kit to work out to the centimeter where everything is. They're, they're just taking a GPS snapshot. One meter for most purposes, I think, is at least as accurate as we need to be. As precise um, as we need to be. As precise as we need to be. Sorry, I do understand the distinction. I just, just use the words loosely sometimes. Um, I think the 10 meter level of precision is no good, to be honest with you. Um, the 10 meter level of precision, um, you could use it for geofencing, certainly. Um, but I would like to hear from operators, particularly whether they think that a 10 meter level of precision could be made to work with their systems. Um, the 10 centimeter level is just unrealistic to achieve. And I don't think we yet know what level of precision or accuracy is going to be needed by autonomous vehicles. Uh, frankly, any autonomous vehicle which has to be guided to the centimetre to the spot where it needs to be is not an autonomous vehicle which is presumably capable of even recognising a bus stop. And autonomous vehicles do need to be able to recognise road signs. Um, Otherwise, whether the sign on the road clashes with the um, the vehicle's own data, it's um, it won't know what to do. Um, so I, I think we're limited actually by what we can provide here. We don't know what autonomous vehicles will need. We know, I think, that pedestrians certainly don't need a 10 centimeter level of accuracy. Um, I don't know whether buses do. As I say, love to hear from some operators there. Um, or some prov providers of ticket machines. I think the 10 meter square is essentially at least what you would be using for geofencing. Cool, that's really good. And I think you've summarized it really well on those three different scales. Um, I got the 10 centimeters from a discussion earlier can't recall exactly who it was from and is probably one of those bits where I'll have to go and do some Googling to confirm it. Um, but let's just say that we're looking at those three layers of precision is, is where we're starting. Um, and I think asking operators what they're using and, and is the one meter accuracy or the one meter precision that most uh, everyone provides, is that close enough? So Lee Dandy. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on this point about um, geofencing. I'm not, um an expert or I'm not really involved day to day with um, real time passenger information. But as I understand it, you know, you do have a zone around a, a NAPTAN point where, you know, a geofence and, and the bus enters that point, enters that zone and is then recognised as having arrived or departed. But, you know, the issue we have is that we have buses that travel down a road um, some considerable distance and then do a U-turn and come back again. Um, and if that if that geofenced area is is wider than the road itself, that bus gets picked up when it's driving past on the other side of the road. So it, it, that bus gets cleared down half a mile before it's actually turned around and come back to the stop. So you know if if that geofence is going to be based on the position of the stop, presumably you you would want to make that geofence small enough so that a bus travelling on the wrong side of the road would not get cleared down and so you're talking about a very very small zone maybe a few meters wide um and you're and you're going to want to center that on the naptan point very 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 precisely am i using the word precisely there accurately precisely um, precisely precisely so um i i i do want I, I wanted to make that point that that naptan position is extremely important for determining whether a bus has arrived or departed for real-time purposes that's a really good point, and thank you for that, Lee. Um, let's go on to Mike Fosker. Thank you. I was just going to reiterate the the first response. I think that that one meter level of precision um, is sufficient, uh, to my understanding, from speaking to our users and consumers. Um, 
I'm, I'm not sure that there's any benefit to the passenger of a 10 centimeter level of precision, irrespective of whether there's other benefits for other consumers of that data. But certainly if we came up to a 10 meter level of precision, um, that could present a lot of problems for representing where the passenger should expect the bus to stop, whether it's this side of the road, that side of the road, or possibly even on an entirely different road, could all easily be within a 10 meter bounding box. Um, so I think one meter is my answer to that question. Excellent. That's really good to know. Uh, Adrian Glover. Yes, thank you. Um, I think we need to take a step back almost, and we need to try and understand what we're trying to organise here. We're trying to identify the precision of where the bus stop is. I don't think we need to concern ourselves about geofences or any of the rest of it, because we can't do that unless we know where the bus stop is. So once we've determined where the bus stop is, the RTI people can then create the geofences. And in a previous life, when I was working for a, a big public transport operator, I used to set the geofences how I wanted them to be and how I'd make them work. Um, but when I was looking at the map, I needed to know where the bus stop was. And I think we must never lose sight of that. Oh, and to answer a previous correspondence question, if you do go through the geofence and turn around and come back, you can set the direction of the geofence so that it will ignore vehicles going in the wrong direction. I think I didn't want to get into bearings today because that's an entire box of worms we didn't want to open right now. Um, I wanted more just to understand what, ac what level of precision we would aim for and if it's one meter by one meter that's nice that's i think six six digits of the eastings northings so that gives us a nice if you're this precise and if you're accurate we and if you set your bus to here or your bus stop to here then everyone agrees that that's where the bus stop is and that's gonna that's a nice outcome from this meeting honestly that's a really good outcome um neil mckinnon Yeah, um, similarly, I think um, uh, 12 figure grid references, um, so a metre accuracy would, is perfectly fine, I, I, I think. And um, I, I think uh, self-driving vehicles, you don't need to worry about. There's so many other sensors that are be calling into play when it comes into to docking that, you know, it's, it's going to be laser, it's going to be heat seeking, it's going to be this, that and the other. GPS is out the window by that point. You're well and truly down to LIDAR. Yeah. Yes, I, I I learned that. We had a talk on it. I learned to, I learned a new word. I still don't understand how it works, but that's a <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole thing. Um, Chris Sherry. Hello. I just wanted to add that I, you know, I think this is a really interesting conversation about the preciseness of the data and and what you define as where the stop is. Um, but uh, for, uh, from a consumer point of view, our biggest concern here is that if um, if we're doing a conversion, it doesn't really matter how precise or, or what we defined as the location of the stop. If, if we're converting it wrong because we thought it was one way and it was another way or something, and it ends up being in the middle of a field 100 metres away, it doesn't really matter how precise the original coordinate was if we have ended up with something quite different. That's also a really good point, and that's something that we will consider, but at least getting the data in right to then convert it we've we've made one step forward we might yeah. we might not make too many more steps forward but we've made one step forward which is which which is is good um and we will look at how we do how we build that conversion and and how we look at it and how we talk about it um mark tyre yeah uh I'm, well, we're going down to the precision of trying to say where the bus stop is what we've got to try and remember is uh, GPS, especially in big built up city centres and all that, can't really get exactly that precise. It's always going to be within a few metres anyway. So if you're trying to pick, trying to pick out where your bus is, it's, you know, it, it's not going to be down to the centimetres. That's a really good point to remember as well. So that one metre square is precise and accurate enough that even if it wobbles slightly with your GPS, it's not going to, it's not going to go. Uh, it shouldn't go a, f a long, long way away, but it's making sure that whatever the Eastings Northings one meter says, it's converted in a way that a GPS can recognise it and doesn't accidentally throw it into the field 100 metres away. 
most take GPS, this point. Most GPS systems are accurate to within three meters, just to put that in. That's that's really that's really I knew there was a three meter in, in here somewhere and I had to redraw this to take away because I originally had my Eastings Northings down to threes, but I think that was the GPS accuracy that I'd I'd put in. Right, so we've got 15 minutes left. Um I I think this has been a really good use of everyone's time. I hope everyone's enjoyed it and has had a chance to put down their thoughts. I'm going to enjoy reading um all of the um all of all of the stuff I just haven't been able to read in the chat and everywhere else. Um, I'm going to summon everybody. I was going to do something about producers and consumers. I'm not going to. I was going to do something a bit confusing there. Um, I will leave this up and I will leave it open for you to make comments on and everything. One of the things that I have here is a bus stop called Soul to Close, which just moves all over the show. And I think this is to do with conversions, middle of road lines, Ordnance surveys, um, con converting from Eastings, Northings to Latlongs. Um, I think it might have also been slightly because it was a new. It's a new build area. It's it's it was put in where it was planned, not where it actually was at some point. So there's been a whole pile of little things. But one of the things that we tried to show with this exercise is the different ways that it's shown in so many different places on different maps. Um, so if you can all have a look, that, that kind of gives an idea of how, what happens when this goes wrong. We know it's Eastings Northings and it's Eastings Northings puts it in mostly the right place now that we know exactly where it physically is, where the pole is. Um, but it is shown so differently on all these different mapping types. So that was really just trying to understand some of what was going on and some of what the impact of this was to help people kind of understand the real world impact of some of this. Um, so the last thing I want you all to do, um, because we're going to definitely have more, more conversations around mapping, um, we've got a little feedback corner. So I'd love to know from you all, what's given you joy, what's been good and useful? What's frustrated you? What's not been good? What's not been useful about today? And what's made you sad? What are the things that have been missing? What are the things that should have been happening? So in the last 15 minutes, well, uh, I'll happily take any questions that anyone has, any thoughts that anyone has still outstanding on this, but I'd like people to kind of take the time and put in there. And this will allow us to iterate and make these better. For example, we reach the point of there should only be 20. If there's, we'll do introductions up to 20 people and after that we'll just choose 20 people and, and have them. I like people to talk and to have the chance during the icebreaker to talk because it means people, if you don't talk during the icebreaker, you generally don't talk at all. It has been one of the one of the things that we've found at some points. Um, but I also really appreciate everyone's time and energy and interactions today. They've been really brilliant. So. On that, does anyone have any thoughts on where we should go next? I know there needs to be a discussion amongst the producers that one meter by one meter accuracy is good and it's based on this particular point and here's why. Um, I also know that there needs to be a discussion about the conversion and I need to go away and talk to Adrian and the team and understand what are the options that we might consider there. Adrian. Um, wasn't there going to be some sort of question about why there are bus stops in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Oh, why there are bus stops in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean? Because we haven't been able to run um, the ability to deprecate bus stops. And that was the response to, um, so old Naptan was supposed to be able to delete archive bus stops. It hasn't been able to for quite a few years. Um, that's a stored procedure that just doesn't appear to have run. And one of the ways of deleting those bus stops uh, that some local authorities used was to put them in the middle of the ocean so that yeah, they could be used. I was going to say, that, that's um, what I was shown to do, but I never did it. Yes, um, we are, one of the things that we need to think about is what does an archived, um, what, what does archiving, what does getting rid of a bus stop look like? If you need yes. to actually get rid of a bus stop from your system, how can we allow it? But also how can other local authorities understand that this bus stop is now dead. It's deader than dead. It will never be recovered, um, which is slightly different from a deleted bus stop, which is 
a, a bus stop that might not be in use but can come back to life. And I know those terminologies might be back to front, but it's an APTAN that was the standard that was set in 2002 and possibly even slightly earlier, but I haven't gone back to earlier NAPTAN versions. But that's It's worth the... remembering that bus stops should not be deleted because investigative data, the buses did stop there. So for investigations in history, it still needs to exist somewhere. Uh, this is why we have archived. So, so yeah. archived allows us to say these bus stops used to exist, but they are now no longer in use because um, that area has been rebuilt and is now what used to be a bus stop is now a um, shopping mall car park or, whatever, or a car yeah. park or something and the bus will never stop at that stop again which is different from a deleted stop where the stop is there may be no pole there may be no furniture there may be no road markings but if uh, an operator wants wanted to put a mm. wanted to run through there again they could come back um one of the things that I also understand is there might be a lot of uh, churn of bus stops and bus routes in the next couple of months coming up um, mm. from reading the news the other day and the uh, passenger response to Omicron variants and things like that. So I just wanted to, um, we need to stop and think about how we manage that and how we keep, allow buses to allow local authorities to say this bus stop, don't try to route through this bus stop because you can't, there isn't anything physically there at the moment. If you want us to make it alive again, you've got to chat to us to make it alive again. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that's what we do. Cool. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on archived and deleted and, and how, to, how to kill a bus stop? <laughs> Um, and is there any any other thoughts on, I, I hesitate to say, conversions, accuracy and precision? Sorry, I'm, I'm going to jump in because I couldn't, couldn't find my hand button. Uh, Mark from Greater Manchester. Uh, we want to archive quite a number of stops that we've never been able to archive just to reduce would... our deleted data set down because we have quite a few thousand that we're still waiting to get rid of. Yeah. Mark, you're top of my list for, for making archive work. I need to work with the team and figure out how we're actually going to make that happen in a way that works for everybody. Adrian, you can stop sharing your screen now if you would like. Um, Roger. Uh, yeah, we're, we're faced with a bit of a fundamental problem when it comes to converting between coordinate systems. Um, the OSGB 36 has not been deprecated in its entirety, only for use with Latin long. Um, when you're using Easting and Northing, you're still using OSGB 36 and its associated projection. WGS 84 uses a slightly different projection, a different geoid. Um, you're never going to get complete agreement between these two, unfortunately. Thank you. And I think that's something that we need to go away and consider and look at what actually this problem is in, is in its entirety because the world is spherical but not entirely like our globe is a lumpy is a lumpy bumpy globe of ball flying through space and we're trying to represent with a piece of data exactly where a bus is going to stop i actually think that's quite remarkable um but also it is a really really tricky thing it's not even mapping onto a sphere it's a spheroid that is irregular and bumpy um, Andy Hull. I just want to mention on archiving and deleting stops that the coordinates and the precision should never be changed. Just mark it as deleted and archived because there's no point saving the data if you then drag it off into the sea because you can't track to it anyway. You can't use it to, to investigate anything later on. Thanks, Andy. I think that's a really good point. Um, I think we've managed to stop people putting bus stops in the sea, um, and I think we've managed to find them all currently. But yeah, we do need to fix up archived and deleted and get it in a way that works for the. There's four or five main systems, and we want to get it to work for those four or five main systems. Lee Dandy. I forgot what my point was going to be now. Um. It's okay. <laughs> uh, oh, um, 
about deleting stops, yeah, or archiving stops. Um, I, I understand the point about um, keeping them so that you can reference them for historical reasons. Um, but there are situations where someone has just set one up in error or it's been set up in entirely the wrong place or you've set up two by accident. So I think there are legitimate cases where you, you've you set something up and you immediately think, I didn't need to do that. And having no mechanism whatsoever to entirely erase that from the from the you know from all record is a shame because we, we've all done things and then immediately thought I don't want that in there at all. Um, totally there with you and that is one of the other um, very geeky webinars that we that we have run um, the, and there will be more coming up this year around um, how stops should be represented the status of stops um, and getting it so that we try and do the right thing with the NAPTAN so that it's a very sensible way of archiving stops. So you can say, oopsie, you can have an oopsie stop or you can get rid of it. And you also know that number will never be accidentally picked up or reused. And this is part of how, what do BODs need from us to know the stops that people shouldn't be using? And that's a really, really fundamental, important point that we need to sort out so that people don't accidentally pick up a, a stop and pick up an archive stop that was an accidental stop and start trying to route buses through it. And that's some of what we're just trying to figure out. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, there's about nine minutes left. Wow, I can't believe I managed that. Um, is there anything else that anyone wants to mention, pick our brains, tell us about? Dr. J, I have something not related to location that I wanted to share. So I'll save myself right to the very end. Um, no, go for it now, Adrian. You've, uh, and then I'll go to Craig. OK, um, I just wanted to flag that for anyone who is uploading to NAPTAN at the moment, it, it is broken. Um, we're not quite sure exactly why, but it's only the FTP that is broken. We haven't touched it. It's done it all by itself. Um, but I, so I would suggest that um, people use the website for now for uploads um, and we'll, we'll do what we can to rectify it and let you know when it's fixed. But if you don't have to upload something, then don't do it this week. Just wait for it to be fixed. If there's no changes, for example, don't necessarily need to upload anything this week. Thank you, Adrian. And this also harkens back to why NAPTAN redevelopment has been proceeding at quite this pace because the system is fragile. We are currently just lightly touching it to figure out how to turn parts of it off. I don't think we've done anything to break it, but we we are so terrified. I've never seen developers more nervous than trying to figure out how they're going to turn off a download link. Um, so Craig, Staten, Staten, <coughs> Standen. Standen, yeah, hi. Um, just to... Uh, to round things out, and so as, as, as we started the call, um, we, we said that, you know, uh, latitude and longitude information is not going to be included in all uh, all rows in the new new NAP10 output. Um, and as I said, this would give us a slight problem um, because we've got systems that rely on the presence of that over Eastings and Northings, given the choice of both, we'll pick the one our developers understand. So that that's where we got to. Um, and really, it's, it's more of a, a, a question, um, but what should we be doing while we wait to agree how we convert the Eastings and Northings into a, a latitude and longitude to allow us to keep, you know, to keep our systems updated? Or should we just expect them to stay in stasis and something will appear in the next uh, next few weeks or months? I I need to have a long discussion with Adrian on this, which we'll do straight after this call. I would suggest that you look at a, at a holding pattern for a couple of months while we sort this out, and then we will be able to come back to you with uh, this is what this is what the plan is. Um, I think there's some been some good ideas from today and, and some stuff that's given me some thinking, but I need to talk about it with Adrian, our product owner. We then need to take it to our SRO board and prioritize it in our list of things to do and have a look at what we should do and what we shouldn't do and what the plans are. Okay, thank you. I think what we're going to do is we will leave it to the last minute and get a snapshot of, um, of it there. So we've got the most up to date that works with our system. Um, 
internally we've got a couple of tools that I think uh I think they're all VB scripts but will turn one into the other and back again. Um so in the interim we will explore using that. Um but it's just to uh to try and understand you know I say to, to, to call out this is a problem that we we will need to see what the solution is going to be for if there's a centrally central conversion algorithm uh fine we can work with that but if you've got 100 people 200 or 100 companies 200 companies using a slightly different algorithm or putting it in a slightly different way um you'll get some interesting results um and probably to the accurate to the accuracy and precision we're talking about it won't necessarily be the issue that we're worried about but it's they're not all going to agree and you, you've seen that yourself when you when you shared things and that's exactly why I included that sold to close um, example, because it's where conversions and mappings and things have it, used slightly different systems and just kind of showing the impact of of all of these. It was um, lost I, on me that the uh, the root number on the, the root number of the bus that stopped there on the flag was 404. <laughs> I hadn't realised literally it was chosen simply because um during one of the lockdowns, uh, one of my work colleagues could literally go to that bus stop without violating any of the lockdown problems. Um, that's how long ago we gathered all of that information. So, Gerard, I know it's I know you fixed one of the problems on it. Um, I just was using it as an example of stuff moving around rather than pointing out the problem of it. Um, Roger Court. Uh, hi, um, it's. Uh, the question for Adrian, actually, and um, a, well, a bit of a suggestion that uh, that Craig almost hinted at there. Uh, it would be really nice if, um, because of the cost of acquiring software to do this uh, automatically is is significant. Gerard pointed that out earlier in the um, the meeting. Uh, we we've just sunk twenty thousand pounds into upgrading our software in order to do that. Um, it would be really handy if there was some sort of tool, and I'm sure this could be done in Excel, which would just allow you to paste a list of stops and their Eastings and Northings in and get an official WGS84 conversion. Um, that's the suggestion. Um, that The question is um, about the CSV files which were available for download. Um, mm -hmm. I understand uh, what's going on with Eastings and Northings, but um, there are a number of tables which are missing from the new system. They're not tables that we use very often, but we do use them occasionally. Um, I was recently asked a question about interchange at rail stations, for instance, which can't be answered um, off the stops table alone. You need the stop areas table to do that. Um, the data involved is still present in the XML file, but of course, opening that up makes you feel like you've gone dyslexic suddenly. Um, I totally it, understand, Roger. It's really um, unpleasant to read through. Um, is there any plan to um, make those available in the future? And, and, and why are we not, basically? Um, so I can explain the kind of why we're not. When we looked at them, so what you what you notice when you go through the 17 files that are automatically produced every time by the old system, there's actually several of them that, are, that have been broken. And they've been broken as far back as I could go on web way back and manage to get a, a reasonable download. They've been broken since about 2016. So those files were creating empty files. There are some files that were pulling inaccurate data. And so what I started to do was do one of these, talking about CSV files. We spent two hours talking about CSV files and actually we spent about six hours talking about them. And we went through all of the different tables and asked people which ones they were using. Um, Stops.csv was the main one that everyone used and it contained most of the data. It contained the data that everyone needed and it's the core file that everything else ran from. Um, so we focused on getting that out, getting that accurate and getting that working. If there are other CSV files that are needed, let's sit down and talk about them and we can have a look at how they're needed, if there's other ways of giving you that same data, what the information that you needed was, and are there different ways of doing that? Um, pardon me, I've just been drinking way, way too much drink to stop my throat from squeaking. Um, does that make sense? And, and feel free to drop me and Adrian um, our contact details are up the top there um, and have a discussion with us about those different tables and why you need them. Because um, 
there's been some discussions about the why on some tables and we haven't found a compelling reason for anything other than stop CSV at the moment. If you do have a compelling reason, yes, I would love to hear it. Uh, yes, I, I, I've sent feedback to somebody by email. I forget okay. who. It may not have been you, Adrian. It may have been somebody else. Uh, but I'll, I'll dig that out and, and forward it on to you both. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris Sherry. Um, I don't know if it's going to be helpful or not but, uh, for Roger, but um, we, um, my colleague Darcy just linked to a open, um, an OS uh, Excel spreadsheet that can be used for various conversions. I haven't personally used it, but we stumbled across it as part of our research for this. Um, so that might be helpful. I don't know if you can, I don't, it doesn't look like you can do things in batch in there, but if you're good with Excel, maybe you can. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say was to kind of reiterate that you know, one of the reasons we requested this meeting was our concern that uh, our conversions were being done differently. What I didn't realise, and, and what's almost more concerning, is that um, some uh, some providers that we we interface with are going to not be downloading the latest NAPTAN because they're not ready to start doing their own conversion. So bus stops might be removed or change, um, and we're keeping up to date by doing our conversion. And, and they might not, and that might cause differences between our systems. I would, I appreciate the sharing of tools, and I think that's a really good idea. We, I will discuss with Adrian, um, and we'll come up with some ideas and share that out to everybody. But I think this has been a really, really good session to get inside the different views of what this is and the different understandings of where all, all this is. Um, and hopefully it's been good for you in that way, Chris. Yeah, it's been a, a very good meeting in that respect. But, uh, it's it's highlighted the issue uh, further for us, I think. Which is, sorry. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's good to know where we things. are. It's, yeah, it's really yeah. good to un have an understanding of what the what the scenario is that we're we're looking at at the moment. Yeah. So thank, yeah. thanks for putting this together. No problems. And I think I think last year we ran something like I think we were running these about once a fortnight. We'll try to keep kind of about one to two a month going on and we'll and we'll do them in the same way of putting them up on Eventbrite and sending them out via the email. So just keep an eye on them and we'll keep doing these um, and doing these sessions on different topics. And hopefully they'll always be interesting if in a very interesting geeky way. Thank you. Mark, you've got the last word before we close this down. Um, going back to the CSV files of NAPTAN, um, we've used stop areas for many of ours to basically to combine all the individual stands of a bus station into a bus station so that everything all on the pit all goes together onto one screen. Um, it, I, I don't know whether, uh, was it Roger before we were saying, he was contacted by someone. I don't know if there was someone from our company or as well as, but I know uh, we were concerned that the stop areas was missing from the CSV. Okay. We, have, we, we do have to still have one system running off CSV and uh, in the short time scales that I think they were alerted to that the old system was coming off. It didn't have time to uh, redevelop with all the shutdown over Christmas. Totally understand. Um, let us have a look at that stop areas as well. And then I'm in the middle of trying to go through all our bus stops to put them all into the little mini stop areas as part of the NAPTAN scheme. And then all the stop hierarchy as well to link the bus, bus stops and stations to the train stations and everything. So I think ideally journey planners are supposed to use it to, for interchanging purposes. I think... Uh, I think stop areas and what it should contain and how it should, just making sure that everyone who uses it is using it for the right reasons and not for the wrong reasons and all of those things will probably be another one of these yeah. because there's yeah. nothing like a two hour meeting on a single yeah. CSV uh -huh. file. Well, I know, uh, well, I know <laughs> things like Google Maps and Apple at a certain Zoom level, it combines all your individual stands into one central um, stop area. And then you can and see all the, you can see all the bus times for the whole station in one go. And I know there's also um, some weird little anom anomalies between some of the systems as well. I know some systems like this stop. They, they, 
their buses to be paired as stop areas and some of them like them to be in slightly different formats. So um, it'd be really good to get as many of the local authorities, as many of the data producers in there talking about how they do stop areas as well as all the different consumers talking about how they consume stop areas and really do this view from both sides, which I think is really valuable to go through. Um, so I'm going to close it down there. Thank you, everybody, for your involvement today, for your time, for your effort. I'll keep the um, mural open for the rest of today. Feel free to add other thoughts and add other comments on there. Um, I, will, I will go through and have a read of them as well as of the chat. Um, and I look forward to the next one of these lovely, fun, geeky moments where we discuss bus stops for two hours. <laughs>